verse we all love so much in Isaiah 9, 6, that he said, his name shall be called wonderful. So join us today, we're going to sing about that wonderful name of Jesus. You that are watching online, you that are here today, let's make this a day of worship and give the Lord praise. His name is wonderful. Wonderful, 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 isn't Jesus my Lord? Wonderful, 
Everybody, good to be in the house of the Lord. I want to continue on. I believe I'm in part two of part seven. <laughs> and we've been talking for weeks about walking in the Spirit. And when you say that, it's not just dancing around and speaking in tongues, but it's actually walking in the Spirit and in the Word of God. And we had overarching texts that I use when we started this series, Galatians 5.16. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So if you walk in the spirit, then you don't have to fight the lusts of the flesh. Well, you fight it, but you win it. And we talked about non-negotiables to get in the entrance just to get born again of the water and the spirit and I talked about a right attitude and I want to reflect on some spiritual attitudes we have I mentioned four non-negotiables about being born again a spiritual calling repentance baptism and infilling of the Holy Ghost and we are on the non-negotiable number two which is repentance and I used for a launching pad I will read this and you can read the rest, but I'll just read the first couple of verses. Acts 16, 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. And if you read on, the keeper of the prison was going to impel himself in an act of suicide plunging his sword through him. But Paul hollered out and said, Do thyself no harm, we're all here. And so the man was immediately baptized, and they baptized him and his whole household. I use this scripture because everybody uses this scripture to in verse 31, and they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in all thy house. And this is the most popular scripture when it comes to this and the thief on the cross, when it comes to doing nothing but just accepting Christ as your personal Savior. So I asked the question to the entire Christendom and to Gateway Christian Fellowship, whatever happened to repentance? Real true repentance. Would you bow your heads with me? Let's pray. Gracious God, we love you. We appreciate you, and we thank you for talking to us and keeping your hand upon us. I ask, Lord, that you touch us and give me words, Lord, that would be helpful to your congregation and help many walk for God and live for God and live for you. I pray and ask in Jesus' name, and everybody say amen. You may be seated. As I read the passage, it's important to remember that the jailer was on the verge of suicide. And he was already at a point of repentance. He was on his knees, broken, trembling before the apostle. His heart was truly prepared to accept whatever had to come in genuine faith. He 
may I say, was not interested in a partial, partway repentance. He was there. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus tells his disciples, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. In verse 15, he said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every, pre every creature. In the school of theology, if you were to take some classes in theology, they would probably give you a class called hermeneutics. Then they would give you a class called spiritual birthing. Spiritual birthing is important, but that's where the argument of religion comes in because everybody wants to change. It's a moving target as to when you're saved, when you're born again. There's a group of Baptist people that believe that it's by selection. It's by election and selection by God, which the Bible says God is a just God. So why would he choose one and say, I'm not going to choose this one and this one and choose another one? And furthermore, why would he choose somebody that's unaware that they're elected or not? So the election is whether you're aware of it or not, you're saved if you're the elected person. Then there's the group that thinks that you're saved at the inception when God starts talking to you and you hear the voice of God in your heart. Then they believe that you're saved at inception. Some believe that there's a drawing power that soon you ha you're saved at conception when you're actually formed in the womb. Inception is the starting point, the voice. Conception is when you're developing after you hear the voice. And then there is a group that believe that you're saved during the nine month gestation period where the fetus is developing. Jesus said it very clearly, you must be born again. In all those stages, none of those include a birth except the water and the spirit, where Jesus said, You must be, marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born of the water and the spirit. For election's sake, Romans 5 6, for when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's the scripture that people believe. There's another group that believe everybody is elected. Whether you're aware of it or not, Jesus Christ died for the ungodly. So if you're part of that, you can appease yourself and say, wow, I'm saved whether I do anything or, or don't do anything or whether I accept it or not, I'm saved. But a true birth is a starting point of inception and conception and drawing inception, conception, because we know no, no man comes to the Father then it's not the gestation period, but it's a born again experience. The Bible says in 1 Peter 2 verse 9, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into this marvelous work. And in Isaiah 29, 18, I'm catching all of you that missed last week up to speed. And in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. Acts 26, 18, to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith in me. And the gospel is interesting because prior to Jesus coming, John the Baptist, the only gospel they had really wasn't good news. It was the Ten Commandments. It was the law. It was the ordinance. It was the whole uh, ceremonial law. It was nothing but, you ha nothing but works. And under that, no man really could be saved. You had to have a sin sacrifice, uh, a lamb yearly at the end of the year or beginning of the next year and if you look at typology there's always a voice that comes first God wants a voice to pierce into darkness Luke 3 verse 4 and 6 as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness prepare ye the way of the Lord make his path straight 
Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be brought low. The crooked shall be made straight, the rough ways shall be made smooth, and all flesh shall see, shall see the salvation of God. He's talking about the wilderness of mankind, that man is found and shaped and fashioned in many different ways. And the voice is the voice that cries in the wilderness of their minds, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John 1 verse 23, Jesus said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. And remember, John said, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and that was the light that lighteth every man that come into the world. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. He uses the thinking word comprehend or the understanding word comprehend. He uses that because he wants you to know that the wilderness is the darkness of all men and women's mind without Christ. He said the darkness comprehended. You have to have a brain to comprehend. What he's saying is those that are without Christ are in darkness and they can't understand. That's why when you come to church, I had uh, someone last week ask me how long I spent in church. I said, well, I've been in church for I can't remember how long, almost 30 years, or I don't know, Brother Wynn, how long we've been in church. 40, some of you, how about that? Time flies. And they said, well, how much time do you spend on Sundays? I said, well, two or three hours. Two or three hours? Yes. How much do you, well, our sermons are about 30 minutes. Well, we have worship sermons, we have teaching, we have Bible classes, we have preaching, and it seems a little, a little excess, excessive, but the wilderness, the darkness of man's mind can't comprehend the goodness of God. So what we, what we want to discover is what was the first message Jesus delivered as he emerged out of the temptation in the wilderness because the wilderness is where he fought the evils that keep men in captivity and in darkness. The scripture says in Matthew 4, 17, and from that time, the wilderness time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus called people to repent even before they believed. I think that we have it backwards when we want people to believe first when they really don't understand repentance. Mark writes, Jesus came into Galilee of Mark 1, 14 and 15, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of, of God, saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. So Jesus Christ called all men and women to repentance first. That was the first message. That was the voice that struck home and made comprehension in the, in the minds of all darkened minds of, of men. And before you came to God, you were of a darkened mind. You didn't understand it. It seemed foolishness. And elsewhere, Jesus says of his, of his, missions, his mission in Matthew 9, 13, I am not call, come to call the righteous, but sinners unto repentance. He told the Galileans, he said in Luke 13, 3, I tell you nay, but except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Now the days one must first get lost in these days before he gets saved, but we, we as a whole, I say Christendom, the kingdom of those who per, uh, propagate Jesus Christ, they account for large numbers of masses of people who blink their eyes for Jesus or raise their hand for Jesus or say the sinner's prayer. Very few of them really have the mind to comprehend what they're doing. Very few of them even, well, very few of them repent even the slightest. But Jesus called people to repent. James says that, you know, I, I, get a, I, I did a funeral in just this week, last week, and I kept hearing from people, oh, that was a great message. 
Brother Stratton, that was a good message. Every once in a while, someone would say, well, I feel in my heart that I could receive that message, and I feel in my heart that I'm saved. You know, I don't care what you feel. I mean, I care about you, and I, I care about your feelings. I wouldn't want to hurt you, but in regards to repentance and living for God, I can't play games. Uh, this ministry, your pastor can't play games. It really doesn't matter what you feel. It's not a proclamation of whether you're saved or not. Well, I know I'm saved. Jesus said it like this. Why do you say you're saved? Or his words exactly. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you keep not my commandments? How do you say you're professing Christian and you're saved, you're born again, and you don't keep his commandments? He said in another place, he said, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did not we do marvelous works in your name? Did not we cast out devils in your name? Did not we feed the homeless? Did not we visit those that were in prison? And he said he's going to turn and he's going to look at him and he's going to say, You worker of iniquity, how dare you call me Lord, Lord? You call me Lord, Lord as though I'm your master and savior? And yet you have iniquity that is unrepented. I'm going to turn and say to you, I knew you not. I don't know you. Go ahead and proclaim all day long if you like. I feel in my heart. Go ahead. Will I work the soup line at the homeless shelter? Go ahead. Well, I did this and I did that. It, have you repented? Have you been born of the water and the spirit? And may I say repenting is turning away from one's sin. You come in a, in a state of repentance to get forgiveness for the sin, but if you never, ever quit the sin, that's not repentance. He said, Nay, I, I say, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Or her, it is sin. You could be in here today. I'm not going to put you through a, a lie detector to see if you really repented or you're born of the water and the spirit. It's not my job. But if you know to do good and you doeth it not, what is it? It's sin. It's unrepented sin because you don't know how to continue doing good and not doing. It's one thing to sin, but get over it. Say, God, I'm done with it. It's over. I've had it. Come repent of your sins. I don't want to know about it. Come repent of your sins and say, God, I'm done, and it's over with in turn. He said, the truth shall set you free. John, 1 John 2, verse 4, He that saith, I know him. Oh, I know the Lord. I fill him in my heart and keepeth not his commandments. Well, I don't do everything the Lord tells me to do because I think some things are extreme then you're a liar and the truth is not in you you don't have truth why even make the proclamation why call me Lord Lord and you don't do the things which I say many will say I've prophesied I've done this I've done that why why make the why make the profession because I'm gonna make a profession back to you because of your unrepented sin I don't know you well I've been born of the water and the spirit well, I raise my hands in worship and jump up and down in service. I don't know you. Well, I, 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 Pastor Adrian knows me. Okay. Brother Stratton knows me. Well, what do you got to say to that, Lord? I don't know you. I don't know you. I don't know who you are. Sundays you repent and Mondays you're a sinner. Sundays you repent, Tuesdays you repent. And Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you're a sinner. I don't want a list of things people do. I don't want to know. But you need to get things right between you and the Lord because he's coming back and there's no time to play around. Jesus' gospel was not just a profession. It was all about repentance. The scripture says in Acts 3, verse 19, to you and I today, repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Repent means to thoroughly be done with it so that God then can do his part 
and blot it out. Acts 8, 32, repent therefore of this thy wickedness and pray God if perhaps if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Isaiah 55, 7, Old Testament prophet, let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man or woman his or her thoughts, and let them return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. John the Baptist, he, did, he didn't have a message of accept Christ as your personal Savior. Come, come fill it in your heart. No, Matthew 3, verse 2, in those days John came, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, repent ye, repent you, repent everyone, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In Matthew 3, verse 7, But when many of the Pharisees and Sadducees came to his baptism, he looked at them, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. People came everywhere to hear John, and John didn't play any games with them. We've traded in what we call Conviction, we now call it condemnation, and we say, There is now therefore no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Condemnation is not conviction. We need preachers to preach and people to preach God's word that preaches it convictingly to where our hearts. The problem with America is everybody's so soft now, everybody has a higher EQ than an IQ. They, they want to they wanna be sued. They want classes. They want 10 lessons on how to be a better, think better about themselves. They want classes on how to do this and how to do that and how to be positive thinker. That's not what Jesus came to do. Jesus came to give your intellect some truth. Except you repent, you shall likewise perish. That's good for the saint that's been living for God for 40-some years, Brother Wynn. And the saint that's been living four months for God and the saint that's been living one day for God. Repent and be converted that your sins would be blotted out. The Messiah, he told him pretty soon this Messiah is going to appear. You better get ready to meet him. Well, I'm excited that he's coming, but I'm telling you you're not prepared because you're still holding on to your sin. Outside, those Pharisees and Sadducees look clean. Some people's sins are viewable. Some new people's sins are very viewable because they don't understand the hyper-holiness that some of us have or had. You may feel excited. Some of the new people's sins are viewable. But what scares me are those Sadducees and Pharisees among us that their sins are not viewable. They're, they're not open. They're not honest. They're not right. You know, Corinth was the most spiritual church Paul had. And it was the most carnal church. I get a little worried sometimes when I see somebody who's always spiritual and jumping around. I'm not saying don't do that. I'm just saying it's always you, and you're always raising your hands. You're always speaking in tongues. You're always giving tongues and interpretation. You're always getting a trip to the third heaven, and you can't even live right. You can't even keep your dress down. You can't keep your pants on. I get a little worried about you when you get that so super hyper spiritual I wonder what your life really is like it's not my problem it's the Lord's he said but inside those of you that have it hidden you're full of dead men's bones you're like a generation of vipers and snakes with absolutely no fear of God you have no concept anymore that you're even a sinner and John the Baptist said, I warn you, I want you to deal with your sins be before you can believe on a Savior to follow him. So repent, turn from your sin, and live a life that reflects a genuine change. I'm not saying you, you haven't messed up. I'm not saying you, you did something wrong. I'm not saying, I'm saying if you have, come to an altar and say, God, give him genuine repentance and say, I'm done with it, it's over. I'm living for you, I'm going all the way, not 99%, I'm going 100% for you day in and day out. The Bible tells us that when they heard the apostle testify in Acts 2 verse 37, they were pricked in their hearts, and they said, men and brethren, what must we do? These, G these Jews got, got overwhelmed with conviction, and they said, men and brethren, what must we do in Acts 2 verse 37? He didn't say, well, let's discuss your life. He said, repent. 
and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Paul didn't tell these people, believe and be saved. Raise your hand for Christ. Blink twice, which gives me a signal you've accepted him as your personal savior. He didn't say that. He didn't say faith plus nothing, minus nothing. He, in James 2, verse 18, Yea, a man say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. In other words, if you have faith, but you don't have the righteous holiness faith works that follow it, then you're a fake and a phony. I'm a fake and a phony. We're all a fake and a phony. James 2, 26, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. James 20, well, it's my faith I'm going to be judged on, and I believe in Lord. Uh, and whenever they say it, they always grab, I know he's here because I feel him. <sighs> <sighs> Revelations 20, 11, John the Revelator writes, he's in the spirit of the Lord on the Lord's day, and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to the works. Did you hear what he said? He said, there's books that give an accountability on each and every one of our lives. And then there's the book of life. And there's the Bible. But the book of life is a book that is simply the book of life. Your name is either in it or your name is not in it. And one day when you're standing at the great white throne judgment, God is decent enough and kind enough and merciful enough to open the books and show you and I what we did and what we didn't do. Well, I feel him in my heart. <sighs> I feel you in my heart. <sighs> well, that's good. I'm glad you feel me in your heart. Let's open the book and see if your name is in it. Let's see if you're in my heart. Let's see if your name is in it, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged. The dead don't even get away, which were, were, were written in the judge concerning the things which were written in the book according to their works. You mean it makes a difference how I behave up here, down here, before I get to heaven? You're judged by your works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. Well, my name used to be in there. Well, what are you waiting on? Get it back in there. He didn't ask them to merely make a decision. He didn't ask them to cast a vote for Jesus. He didn't ask them to shake a hand. He didn't ask them to blink of an eye. No, he told them to repent and be baptized in obedience to Jesus Christ, Acts 2, verse 38. What gospel did Paul preach at the pagans, at uh, the Athenians at, and on Mars Hill? He told them directly in Acts 17, 30, God now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. The Greeks had no problems believing in, God's, in Paul's God. Uh, the, in fact, that was what their favorite pastime was, was believing in all gods. They believed in many gods, first this one, then that one. It's like many people who go to ch this church, that church, can't figure out what church they need to belong to. You were born of the water and the spirit. You belong here. You don't belong anywhere else. Well, I can't get along with the pastor. Well, change something inside of you. Oh, you're so spoiled, rotten. You want everybody to change everything for you. Well, my mom always gave me a burger with cheese and an extra dill pickle. Tough luck. Jesus wants you to repent in a genuine repentance. Like many that go to church, then go to this church. 
Whenever someone came along preaching a God per persuasively, they believed it, the Athenians. Even though they, all the while they're living in sin, simple belief wasn't enough. Paul told them, oh, no, 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 no. You can't do that living for Jesus. He can't be added to your, your great list of many gods. You may believe in them all, but you can't, you can't do that with Jesus. You either believe in him and none of them or all them and none of him. He commands his followers to repent and be cleansed. Acts 3.19, he says to them, Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord. In verse 22 of Acts 8, he says, Repent, thereof, of thy wickedness, and pray, God, perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven. Acts 17.30, In the times of ignorance, what were the ignorance? When Gentiles walked in ignorance, because the gospels opened up to them, God winked at, but now commandeth all men, all men and women everywhere to repent. Later, Paul preached the same gospel to King Agrippa in Acts 26, verse 19 and 20. I was not obedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them in Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and the men and then in, to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Paul is saying, everywhere I preached, everywhere I went, I didn't say accept Christ as your personal Savior. I didn't shake your hand. I didn't say, do you have a good feeling in your heart? Do you feel like you're saved? Do you feel wonderful? Are you excited about hearing the voice of God? No. He makes it very clear. He says, I preach repentance, genuine repentance that proves itself by its actions. The passage makes it very clear to the apostolic church to preach unabashedly as Paul did, unabashedly as Peter did, unabashedly as John did, and as Jesus preached. Simply repent for the remission of your sins. Paul didn't say saved. Oh, that's just superstition. Just do the best you can. He didn't say saved. Oh, don't trouble yourself with such whims. Life's so short. Just eat, drink, and be merry and make the most out of life with what you have. Saved, well, you just do the best you can for now on, and Christ will do the rest. Saved, well, that's just the mankind labor and toil for God and mankind. Just a footnote, the whole jailer, his crew and his household got saved. They repented. They got baptized in Jesus' name. I can't overemphasize the importance of men being spiritual leaders in their home. Saved, well, other kids get to decide if they want to go to church or not. Not under my roof, you don't. Well, other kids, you, they don't go through their dressers. Not under my roof. That dresser belongs to me. Those clothes belong to me. Well, you're just a hard nose. No, I want to see everybody saved. I have a tender heart. I have a merciful heart. I, I pray for those, the most detestable sinners you cannot believe. What does it mean to repent? Some Christians believe it simply means turn around or have a change of direction or go the opposite direction. The Bible tells us that repentance is much more than this. I heard a, a man say one time, he said, I'm so glad I understand the Greek and have read the Greek New Testament. It translates repent meaning to change one's mind. I'm glad I changed my mind about Jesus. That told me that that man doesn't know what the Greek re word repentance means because the Greek does, gospel does not say that. The full literal meaning of repent in the New Testament is repent to feel remorse and self-reproach for one's sins against God and God's holiness, to be contrite, sorry, to want to change direction. I remember I've told this before, my cousin Carol, we were at a party and her, her boyfriend that she lived with, she invited me. She said it was a Christian party. So I came by, I was going to witness. And they, they had a big old fight, and everybody's getting drunk and doing drugs. And she came up, distraught beside herself. I was getting out of there, and she said, Can you believe this? This is the last man I'm going to live with that is not a Christian. I thought you were a Christian. People have a skewed sense of what morality is. The, the change of direction is, 
in the word want, to want to change direction. True repentance includes a desire to want to change. Moreover, simply being sorry or simply being contrite doesn't constitute repentance, but rather true sorrow leads to repentance. Paul states in 2 Corinthians 7.10, I'm giving you a lot of word because I want you to know exactly what it takes to stay saved. I remember reading a, a, a comic book. Brother Graydon brought it to my attention. There used to be a comic strip in the Sun-Telegram called Peanuts. And the gang in Peanuts was Charlie Brown, Lucy, Linus, Snoopy, and Pigpen. And it's interesting to me because in this, one of the last few times I read it, Charlie Brown was always practicing his football. And Lucy was always one that was willing to hold the football for him. This last time, Lucy says, here, I'll hold the football. Oh, no, you won't, Lucy. I remember time after time after time, right when I run with all my might to show off for you and kick that football a mile away from here, you always pull the football out. I kick. It brings me up off my legs, and I fall flat on my back and knock my head, and I'm dizzy for weeks. She says, Charlie Brown, I promise I won't do it. Oh, no, I don't trust you. In this particular comic strip, she started crying, and tears were trickling down. She said, Charlie Brown, what I've done to you is wrong. It's so wrong. All those times I pulled that ball and let you land flat on your back, it's wrong. Can't you, can't you see that, that I'm confessing to you that it's been wrong? Please let me hold the ball. He says, all right, Lucy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you hold it. This, I, I trust you. So he goes back. He get, backs up further. He backs up further. He comes running full throttle steam. He kicks that ball, but she jerks the ball right as he goes to kick it. He flies way up in the air, falls back down on his back and his head, and there's Lucy standing over him saying, just because someone knows it's wrong doesn't mean that they're going to change their ways. And that's the way some people are in living for God. Some people know what they do is wrong, but they're not interested in changing their ways. Lucy was without regret, regrets. And that sticks in the life of a repentant person. They have regrets. The kind of godly sorrow that produces repentance is a hatred for sin, a righteous fear of God, and a desire to right all wrongs and be the best person they can be the rest of their life until the rapture. Recognizing your faults and wrongs and actually changing are two different things, Charlie Brown. Don't you know that? It shouldn't surprise us that Paul preached repentance to all would-be Christians. He delivered a strong message to Christians in Corinth. And the Corinth believers have been richly blessed by God, having sat under mighty teachers. And their congregation still remained rife, full of sin. The Corinth church was so rife with sin, it was the most spiritual and most carnal. Paul testifies of the Corinthians in this way. He says in 2 Corinthians 12, 12, Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. As far as spiritual stuff, man, you guys have it down to a science. As far as, far as signs and wonders, you've got it down. As far as tongues and interpretation, you've got it down. I'm telling you, as far as the wonders and mighty deeds, you've got it down. Then Paul says directly, quote, I fear lest when I come, I should not find you such as I would, verse 20. What was Paul's fear? What, what did he fear when that he was going he was gonna to come to church, a, a mighty church? They had tongues and interpretation. They had healings. They had miracles. They had, they had people dancing around, probably climbing the poles and jumping up and down and biting the ceiling and, and speaking in tongues and tongues and interpretation and People volunteered to work the soup line and help the poor and visit the people in prison. Paul, what's your fear going to this great fear, this great church? It was simply this. He says, quote, Lest or when I come again, 
my God will humble me among you and that I shall be well. I'm going to be humbled to tears. Many which have sinned already have not repented of the uncleanness. What uncleanness, Paul? This is a spiritual church. Fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed, verse 21. Signs and wonders were superseded and placed far above repentance in this church at Corinth. I don't care who you are. I don't care how old you are, how, how young you are. You can't make it in this life, in this walk with God without repentance. You need to make it, a, uh, even if you think you're doing a, a, a great, having a great day, humble yourself and say, God, make me have another great day tomorrow and always keep me in the spirit of repentance that when I do something wrong, I want to be so tender in my heart that I can go to somebody and say I'm sorry or I can, I can make something right with somebody, but I'm going to do my very best to live for you and be someone who when you come after me, I don't find you in tears, Paul. He said, lest when I come, I, I don't want to be humbled and, and cry because I know I have because some of you have not repented. Always on display you are, Corinth, but no holiness. Always recognizing your sin, but no change. Always having godly fear, but not enough to repent. They knew they had been taught well and taught a life, and yet they lived in a lifestyle of gross sin and it was wrong. And he told them, when I come to visit you, and you see me hanging my head in grief and my eyes flowing with tears and my voice will well in sorrow if I see you continuing to indulge, indulge in uncleanness, fornication, and lust. I will utterly be broken because the gospel has not done its work in your heart. You haven't repented of your sin and I will call loudly of your repentance. Samuel said this, which was interesting, at Saul's sin. He had self-will, and he wanted to do it his way, the way he wanted to do it. I learned a long time ago in living for God that maybe it's worn out, but this isn't Burger King. You can't order it up your way. You got to take it the way the Word delivers it. In Samuel 15, 1 Samuel 15, 22 and 23, and Samuel said, Hath the Lord ha has hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord Saul was supposed to kill every animal and Saul got greedy and he says I'm going to save these good looking animals and I'm going to save more than enough for me and I'm going to save more than enough to sacrifice unto God and Samuel said what's better Saul you obeying the voice of the Lord or you sacrificing. That was a church at Corinth that wanted to do all kinds of sacrifices rather than obey the voice of the Lord. He said, for re rebellion, not obeying the Lord, voice of the Lord is the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is the iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. In other words, what he said was, jump around, Raise your hands, speak in tongues, give tongues and in interpretation, make mighty offerings to the church, be the biggest donor and giver. But if you're not obeying the voice of the Lord, then you're a sinner, and I want no part of you, is what God is saying. Many will say to me in that day, Did not we do marvelous works in your names? Did not we do miracles? Did not we heal the sick? Did not we feed the, the poor? And he's going to laugh. Your profession isn't good enough. He's going to say, you worker of iniquity, you sinner, you sinner, I knew you not. Psalms chapter 34, verse 8. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and save as such that be of a contrite, a spirit, a down spirit, not a violent spirit, not a pounding to the power of works in the flesh, but a contrite, somebody who is humble, who's made themselves, who, who crawls up and kneels before the Lord. The works of the flesh are these. Here is the antithesis of the walk in the Spirit. Oh, you got the Holy Ghost, but you still have some of these in your life. The works of the flesh are manifest. You have the Holy Ghost, but you still have adultery in your life. 
You have the Holy Ghost, but you still have fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. You have the Holy Ghost, and you, you love the Lord, but you still have idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, heresies, envyings, murder, drunkenness, revelings of such, which I tell you, as I've told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service. Do you know in the Old Testament when they brought a lamb for a sacrifice for the sins of Israel, the high priest inspected every quarter inch, every inch of that lamb. What God is saying what Paul, through Paul is he's saying, I beseech you or I beg you every time, every day you wake up, search every square inch of yourself internally and externally. I beseech you by the tender mercies of God that you present. Before you present, make sure you made the search. Present yourselves a sacrifice, a humble, a contrite spirit before God, which is only your reasonable service. What are the sacrifices that God accepts? Psalms 51, 17, a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O oh God, thou will not despise. Isaiah 57, 5, for thus saying the high and lofty one that inhabiteth in eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in high and holy place with him. Also he that is of a contrite, humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble, to revive the heart to the contrite ones. <coughs> Isaiah 66, 2. For all those hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, poor in the spirit of the world and man in pride, but poor in of that spirit in contrite, humble in the spirit of God, and trembles at his word. You know, the word of Paul make me want to really preach it right. As I read these words, I find, I find myself examining my teaching and preaching, and, and I've come to the conclusion that a preacher and a teacher does not have the right to cut the gospel short that Jesus preached. We don't have the right to essentially cut short and remove the higher cost of following Jesus Christ. We don't have the right to preach a message of just believe and accept Christ as your personal Savior and you're saved. As I look at church today, I wonder, do we preachers insist on biblical godly sorrow as evidence of true repentance? Do we lead the masses of people, of, in, of unrepentant, people unrepentant people into false peace? We are wrong if we're doing that. If all we're doing is instructing them to just believe in Jesus Christ, then we have cut them short of a genuine conviction of sins. They jumped into the offered and offered salvation to those who have, who have obviously not repented. We've jumped in and haven't offered them sorrow over their trespasses or demanded it. We haven't seen the exceedingly sinfulness of their sins. People who have sought faith so they could merely hide their lust behind it. We hear constantly exaggerations of people. 100,000 came to the Lord. 10,000 came to the Lord. We, we, can't, we ask for uh, uh, everybody to raise their hands in the convention center. 200,000 people raised their hand and converted to Christ. Without repentance, without godly sorrow, without a born-again experience, without baptism in Jesus' name, without the infilling of the Holy Ghost, it's all a charade. It's a farce. But you, my friends, you who are part of Gateway Christian Fellowship have the right to come any time you need to come to the throne room of grace where you can come humbly with a contrite spirit and a, and a, wanting, a, a, a wantingness inside of you that says, I want to be right. I want to be what God wants me to be. This is my chance, and I'm going to take advantage of it. <clears throat> Not just... It's a tragic, it's tragic exaggeration to me. All too often, people just want to repeat a simple prayer, and people never experience a deep work of the Holy Ghost. As a result, they never repent, they never sorrow over sins, and they're never truly repented. Jesus, 
well, we offer them something. We, we offer them salvation without repentance. We offer them faith without repentance. We offer them a walk with God without repentance. And it's all a charade. It's a farce. I personally believe, as I mentioned earlier, the church has turned conviction into condemnation. There is nothing wrong with being convicted over your sins. There's nothing wrong with coming to an altar and weeping and crying in conviction over your sins. But I've noticed as I've watched people repent, it's hard for me to stand in one place a long time these days, but when I notice people repenting, I very rarely see any more tears on cheeks. I'm not saying tears on cheeks is what saves you, but it sure is a, a good reflection of the heart if they're sincere from the heart and you have godly sorrow working in you. Of course, I know that tears don't save anyone, but God made us all human with very real feelings, and anybody who's hell-bound like I was and was a sinful sinner like I was, when they re felt the, the natural God-given feeling of the Holy Ghost, it was evident when I started crying and I couldn't stop crying that I knew God had granted me repentance. The Apostle Peter felt that kind of sorrow when he denied the Lord. He walked through the Jerusalem in the streets and he said, I've denied the Lord, I've denied the Lord, I've denied the Lord, I've rejected him. He was repentant. Peter called to mind in Mark 14:72, where he said, when the cock crows twice, three times, thou, you have denied me thrice. And he thought and he wept and remembered and he was overcome by the emotion. I know what he was feeling. He was feeling, I betrayed the Lord. Some of you here today have betrayed the Lord. And you know you're doing wrong, and you know you're living wrong. You betrayed the Lord. But you've kept up the farce so long that you can't change it. I'm calling you to repentance today. I'm calling you to give it to the Lord today and be done with it. I'm calling you to sell out like Peter did, who was wounded over hurting his loving Savior. And that revelation of how we hurt our Savior ought to be enough to bring godly sorrow that worketh repentance. You know, I don't agree with all the Puritans' way of salvation, but I do agree when they talked about their preachers, they, they, they said their congregations needed to have true repentance and their preachers need to plow deep and plow past the fallow, shallow ground and plow. Deep plowing is what they call it. It sowed true seeds of faith. It helped the people repent. Today, however, so we, all we want is to sow. We don't want any plowing. We want to throw the seed out and hope that maybe somebody, a dog dug a ditch somewhere over here and and a seed fell into some deep, deep soil. But most of it is water off a duck's back because there's no deep plowing going on in anybody's hearts anymore. I'm not saying gateway because I know a lot of you are sincere and godly and I know your pastor preaches it hard and hot and heavy and thank God for him and pray that he always keeps it that way. I am out of time as usual. It's my earmark. But I'm asking you today after the preaching or during the preaching, I, it's not time to play. It's not time to pretend. It's time to seriously get alone with God and make some time at this altar. Will you stand with me?